Ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else, I am thrilled to be here with one of the most adorable interlocutors a guy could ask for. Ah. Praise be to the elephant sun god. It's the justifiably grandiose bride tackler himself, a guy who, according to a study I recently read from the U.S. Department of Conceptual Resources, is the number one user of the words nomothetic and spectralizing. <laughs> yes, it's the chairman of the board of the Unified Theory of Knowledge and the champion of psychological integration. It's Greg Henriquez. Hey, Greg. Holy <laughs> hell. There's no place I'd rather be than in your wonderful introductory bosom. <laughs> I feel homed, my friend. Oh, good. <laughs> Listen, in an imaginary scenario where I'm the emperor or general of all integrative pluralist liminal metawebs, what do I need a break? Is that imaginary? That's right, it might be. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I'm approaching the idea now. <laughs> right. But, but it may be really, descriptive. That's kind of <laughs> Yeah. At least suggestive. <laughs> in that army I've got, what, what does a Greg Henriquez do? Where should I be deploying his capacity best? Very good. Right. Well, it, uh, the rumor has it we have a meaning and mental health crisis there, Layman. Okay. Uh, and and there is uh, there's a logos, a uh, B of Sophia logos that the U talk helps us deeply with. Uh, specifically, it diagnoses very clearly the problem that comes off the Enlightenment, which basically is from a very strong scientific perspective. I'll say it this way: coming off of psyche pathology, essentially science gets rid of the psyche. Okay, we talk about qualitative, ideographic, rather than nomenthetic. Hey, I need to get that in. Aspectualizing these different frames. Basically, science in many ways gets rid of the psyche. Okay. Uh, and what I mean by that is this unique, subjective, ideographic, particular in the world. And then it generates these nomenthetic, extra, exterior, per, epistemologically grounded perspectives. Um, and then we get the hard problem of consciousness and the problem of psychology. You know? Um, and I think the problem of psychology is a much better way of framing it than the hard problem of consciousness, although that's uh, in contrast to the philosophical wisdom of the day. Um, but I'm like, actually, a much better frames the problem of psychology, and we can solve it. And so you talk then says, hey, you can solve the problem of psychology, which ultimately means you can address the most difficult problem that came out of the Enlightenment, um, which is then this solves that by giving us a coherent, integrative philosophy, okay, that's naturalistic. Um, and not, I'm not saying it's not you know, theistic. I'm just saying it is grounded in naturalism. It gives it coherence, brings us clarity about our souls and spirits in the world in a way that affords uh, us to then reground ourselves. And by the way, it started at this issue of psychotherapy, uh, psychotherapy dealing with these neurotic maladaptive loops where people are dealing with nihilism and bitterness and self-critique and other conflict and all this other shit that makes all sorts of suffering. Well, yeah, we got a meaning mental health crisis. Uh, this diagnoses it. It reshifts the focus in a way that's, oh, yeah, everyone agrees the hard problem of consciousness. Actually, we reframe it as the problem of psychology. Solve that fucking problem and then do so in a way that's directly relevant to uh, the mental health crisis. Well, I'm a, that's, a, that's, that's something in the army. All right. I, I'm, I deserve I, I, it to be in the army. I, I'm putting you in charge of a battalion in that operating theater. Uh, lovely. <laughs> All right. That's right. It, it isn't the only, it isn't the whole theater. Let me be clear. Some people think I'm grandiose enough to say it's the whole fucking thing. I don't, and I'm not, but it's a, it's a section uh, of the chirotic moment we find ourselves in and it affords a particular um, slice of information and guidance. Okay. That's a great starting point. Maybe I'll do a little bit of background to set up this conversation because you and I did a trilogy of discussions expanding and deepening the concept of pathology. Yep. Uh, in the first one, I threw a bunch of classic and idiosyncratic examples of pathology at you to see if the answers would flesh out a UTOC DSM. Mm -hmm. And then we explored more speculative things like supranormal capacities. Are they the reciprocal of pathology? What are the destabilizing aspects of higher states? And what are the possibilities of setting a higher human standard by quasi-pathologizing normal psychology? Totally. And then we plunged into my favorite, the trans justificatory, as a landscape of radical consciousness conditions that exit from the basic undergirding structures shared by all justification systems and narrative selves. And in all of that process, I think we got a rich, messy sense of each other's general notions of well being and pathology. Totally. Uh, mine leaning to spirituality, integration, surplus, and adjacency, and yours leaning toward these decades of work you've put in providing a descriptive model of the shared core anatomy of psychology 
and also exactly. your methodological scheme for framing psychological interventions. And you've been taking that stuff up lately on a series with John Verveke and Gary Hovhannisian. <laughs> I'll go with that. God love you, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> and since the integral sage has a habit of platforming maniacs, we thought we should definitely discuss this with you and unpack your vision and throw a few quibbles at it. So I got, first of all, what's going on? What is this series you're doing with John and Gary and what's your fantasy about what it could potentially accomplish? Lovely. Um, well, uh, you know, uh, the bridging uh, that of John and I, uh, basically the cognitive science series, at least thus far, has essentially, in my estimation, shown it's been a way to showcase John's version of reality, uh, where he diagnoses cognition, both from a recursive relevance realization perspective and a four P cognitive uh, four P's of knowing perspective. And that gives us mastery uh, around it gives us metaphysical, ontological and meta theoretical mastery around the concept of cognition. OK, then you bridge that over to you talk, which is trying to give us metaphysical, ontological, meta theoretical mastery on the concept of psychology writ large. Uh, so what you then have now is an emerging series that is stitching together two individuals climbing up ontological, meta-theoretical mountains uh, in cognitive science and psychology, first tackling the problem of consciousness, then tackling the problem of self, and then clarifying meta-psychology and transformation. Uh, so that's what we've done. So then the emergence of this uh, happened when I listened to him uh, give a talk with Gary on some of the work that they had been doing, Okay. And that was taking recursive relevance realization, Colin DeYoung's model that bridges some of what's called a cybernetic formulation with Big Five. And then Gary was taking the um, John's model and Colin DeYoung's model and saying, hey, we can, he's getting trained as a clinician. He's saying that we can utilize these models to understand trait theory and from a sort of dispositional behavioral perspective and attachment theory. Okay. And I listened to that and basically, you know, if you know, you talk, you know, you talk actually not to be, well, I am grandiose. So fuck it. Actually, you talk advances this ball substantially. Okay. Already. And it argues that actually there's some missing insights that uh, Gary and John were sort of making that could be filled in with the you talk analysis specifically around character adaptation. Okay. I built a system called character adaptation systems theory, which really is the fifth branch on the tree of life. And what it is, is it's the bridge between the unified theory Okay. And psychotherapy. That's why it's on the four sides of the unified theory. And then you bridge over and it, the way it organizes both human personality and the key insights of psychotherapy is why it's a bridging concept. Okay. And it's that bridging concept that afforded me the capacity to see with much greater detail, both why John and Gary were on the right path and how to give more uh, connectedness, richness, depth, relevance for psychotherapy to it. So I mentioned that to John, we started getting talking and then we're like, well, how are we going to set this up? Okay. Uh, where's this kind of, how is this going to kind of fit in? And it's like, well, if we're headed towards sort of adaptive functioning persons and well-being, we're going to, let's do something in relationship with that. Okay. And, and so I was like, well, yeah, cause you guys can set it up. We'll problematize the mind. Okay. And then I'm going to bring character adaptation systems and the nested model of well-being. And I will then bring that lens and then Gary will bring the bridging between trait theory, um, attachment theory and recursive relevance realization. And we'll sort of stick this word together. And then I said to him, I said, you know, I'm also working on this new concept, this new formulation of the psyche. Okay. Um, and I, in my past, I've used the word psyche pretty loosely. It doesn't appear, it appears twice in my unified theory book in 2011. Okay. Uh, and it wasn't part of my vocabulary, but I had solidified a proper, a, a potential proper use of the term over the last six months in Utah. Okay. And what it referred to then is the inside out view. Okay. From the conscious subject, the unique subject, subjective, particular qualitative ideographic in the real view. <laughs> okay. The thing that science canceled out, the things that's a hard problem of consciousness. I actually can organize the proper use of the psyche that it references the view, epistemic view inside out and contrast that with psychology with its anchor in natural science, okay, as inevitably being a behavioral outside in view, okay, which now meant that actually psyche is now differentiated from the science of psychology strongly. And in Utah, actually, the science of psychology is then held by the tree of knowledge system, 
okay? And the psyche is actually held by the coin. The coin's a placeholder for the psyche. So I was playing more and more around with psyche and I ran this formulation by John. I was like, listen, John, uh, does this resonate with your sense? And he was actually, he's the one that generated, oh, you're talking the inside out vector as opposed to the outside in vector. And that really, and then that sat with him. So while we were building the series, we then agreed that this was then an opportunity, not only to bring these things together, but to specify the nature of psyche relative to psychology. Okay. And then afford us a capacity to kind of propose that model uh, and then situate it with, by also stitching together all the other stuff that initially set it up. And that gave it then this unique twist where we called it then psyche pathology. It was originally psychopathology. And then we're like, no, we'll make, add this additional twist um, and really try to lay out the psyche psychology relation as another nuanced piece of this sort of mental field vocabulary that we're building together. Yeah. Fantastic. And very resonant with um, the way people have been thinking in the integral community about Mm. an inner and outer aspect of the upper left quadrant. Right. Of course. Yes. So be, be very clear. Obviously, if you just, if you're walking around with basic Wilbur 101, you know, the interior exterior epistemological divide. (laughs) Exactly. And that's where the suturing of those two together is where psychology should be situated, you're thinking. A hundred percent. And John and I can immediately see that both of us, his theory of cognition and the overall you talk, are actually, we can frame them properly as transjective theories, meaning that actually they, they do their best work when you watch, put people in motion across time, where you're going to have inside out, outside in processes, you know, uh, if you, unless you're going to be some radical skeptic, maybe we're all fucking zombies. Um, but anyway, you're going to have basic inside outside processes. Uh, and then there, there needs to be an information interface. And then we want causal explanatory structures that afford the capacity to look lensing inside and out. Okay. So behavioral investment theory, the influence matrix and justification for me, what I call the Jai dynamics of human being, I can feel my psyche investing. <laughs> I can feel my internal working models. I can see my justification. And if you take a film of me, you can see my body investing. You can see my engagement and influence and you can see us justifying. Um, so at, at the same with John, as, you know, the recursive relevance realization can similarly be framed as this transjective dynamic, between, you know, y- yoking together outside in and inside out. Uh, so both of us really do sit in a, if you're going to have a unified view, you're going to have to, just like Wilbur saw, you're going to have to be able to manage both of those epistemic vectors. So you're handling a psychology with these uh, interacting dimensions. Um, but there's also these, I mean, throughout the series that you're doing, there's a real emphasis both on grounding our thinking in a transjective view of reality and also on leaning into the dialogical and exchange notion of all of the parts of the model that we're building. Absolutely. I mean, you know, that's, of course, the, the, the ethos of the series or whatever uh, is dialogos. Uh, so which is, a you know, one of the things when John proposed, hey, let's do this Untangling World Not series. I was like, oh, great. I could talk to John and blah, blah, blah. You know, <laughs> like, and it really was set up that I would essentially be the student and then he would tell me about his model and I would and I would support that. And then I'd be able to bring my model along. <laughs> which was great. And I was really looking forward to it. Um, but the also reality was after I fell asleep and I was like, Oh, I get to hang out with John. That's good. I woke up the next day. And I was like, this is more than me hanging out with John. <laughs> you know, this is actually John and I embarking on a new kind of uh, academic process. Okay. Uh, instead of like peer review papers uh, and even special issues where you have papers and then commentary and then conclusion, we're actually literally setting up a series of uh, a dialogue between scholars Okay, to see what evolves with the with the dialogos being the actual academic ethos that we're now trying to cultivate in the Zoom world, affording a totally different medium, you know, than what was afforded in the past. So the entire series across all the series is designed to basically bring scholars together and start the process of dialogue to see what we can co-create uncover together, see if we can get in rhythm with the unfolding of reality in the collective intelligence sense and come away with new insights, you know? Um, so, and it went, and I love that you're thinking it that way, because this is doing these things is very different than writing an article for psychology today. Oh God. But it's no less than that. It may be much more than that. I think it's, I mean, setting it up as a basic function of the academic development of a discipline is a really good way to think about that. 
if you, if we get out of the propositional, the old modernist propositional knowledge is what true knowledge is, and extend and broaden that to John's four Ps. When I think about what do I know, it's coming off of the conversations with you. I go for a walk and I am embodied as a function of the resonance of the dialogue that we just encountered. And it's pushing my edges. Now, sometimes that happens certainly with a book, but the ease and the regularity and the felt sense of realness that it happens with another person is, I, I believe, really key to the uh, message. And yeah, I think it's unbelievably generative and, and, and it essentially is a certainly needs to be seriously considered as an alternative, if not what may become a primary mode of uh, sort of academic engagement uh, and then an academic, personal, professional, communal uh, mode. Well, I'm uh, trying to make sure that I'm up to date <laughs> on where these discourses are. How would I summarize? So psychopathology, or which is actually more like psychopathodiology, <laughs> uh, is, is an approach that is rebuilding psychotherapy from the ground up, where the ground is something like functional non-dualism, transjectivity, or you know, an adjacent universe, such that each stage and component of psychology is participating in an emergent dialogical relational behavior exchange system, but that's rooted in a shared self-differential medium of reality that affords, rather than is defined by the basic structural dichotomies like subjective and objective. And that means that psychological disorders are described as maladaptive knots or insufficiencies within embedded relational exchange systems that can be correlated to multiple emergent layers of natural history in the enacted minds. And to fully operate in this kind of scenario, a therapist would require both a sufficient model of our plural subjective anatomy and the interaction domains uh, in which well-being and pathology operate. And they need to understand that as being deployed in a conversational exchange between a person's uh, self-descriptive, maybe folk psychological model of themselves and the therapist's analytic third-person discourse about how persons operate generally. And they also would need a kind of operational social authority that must derive from philosophical coherence and practical results and not from analogies to physics and exaggerated alliances with the legal corporate medical pharmacology industry. And all of this has to be done in a way that leverages, but does not uh, succumb to the patient's fantasy that the therapist is the authorized expert on their own ideographic psyche. So what am I leaving out of that summary? <laughs> fucking print it. I mean, you're not, you're not needing, you don't need to be brought up to speed. We need to hire you as an advertiser. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a, exactly. I mean, that's a wonderfully elegant, um, you know, and rich nuanced, uh, but also at least as far as where I'm sitting, very clear sort of comprehensive package of what it is that we're trying to, um, what I'll say is this, because if people get, it's easy to get me confused um, because I embed my words in particular historical context. So the concept of psychology, I want to be clear, depending on what your frame of reference is, it goes way the fuck back. I mean, Aristotle braces the word psyche and goes way the hell back. Okay. But my formal training places it in the science of psychology. Okay. So I want to then say that actually, yes, it really institution is born in that regard. And then it has to conform itself to natural science epistemology. Okay, now some people say get it out of there, uh, and that's a good argument. I'm saying no, it's going to conform. And the question is, can coherently conform? And the unified theory answered the question yes by saying that scientists can have misconstrued mind and behavior and should call it mental behavior. It's a kind of behavior we're interested in and maintaining a scientific ground. And mental behavior is mind that emerges out of life as mapped by the tree of knowledge. Okay. And what that means is that one kind of mental behavior is animal mental behavior. And then as you look at the culture dimension and justification, you're like, oh, there's human mental behavior on top of that. Okay. Why am I saying this? Because what I'm saying is I argued that the subject matter of scientific psychology, basic is animal mental. And then the subject matter of human psychology is human mental behavior. Okay. And then those two are very different because the human deals with a whole nother layer of complexification, the culture person plane of existence and justification. Okay. I argued that there were three branches of psychology, two are that are the base science, basic science and then human. And then there's this other branch called professional psychology. Okay. In fact, I'm a trainer 
in the combined integrated doctoral program at James Madison to train people not to become basic psychologists or human psychologists, okay, but rather to become psychological doctors. Okay. And that was a whole nother. Now here's the punchline that gets you to the center of what you just delineated, at least what the new insight is, is the realization that the concept of psyche is the proper subject matter for psychological doctors. Okay. I'll say that again, the concept of psyche, the unique, real, ideographic, out, inside out view of the world is actually what we generally deal with. In fact, this is what Rogers is trying to empathize with. Okay. And the cool thing then is now I can say basic psychology is mental behavior, human psychology is animal mental behavior from the outside. Psychotherapists then go empathize with the psyche and try to relate to the act. Okay. And no one's ever really put together the way to be a psychological doctor situated in the science outside in, empathizing with the psyche inside out. Okay. And, and that's what, from, a, from the cutting edge of you talk, at least, from my particular best who's devoted my entire life to try to sort out all these issues, that those positions fall very neatly. And then I now have mastery of those positions is actually a new development. And that is actually why a lot of what you just articulated, in my estimation, actually can cohere and come together. I'm curious how you think about where the boundary is at which the animal psychological behavioral begins. Right? I mediated that discussion with you and Steve McIntosh, and there was a yep. bit of a tension point around uh, <laughs> how, yeah, how no. much of the plant world is included here, right? But it's totally. we don't normally think of something that goes wrong with plants as being a pathology. Uh, but what is it? Where do they have to get to? Is it mobility? Of the organism, right. or is yeah. it having an additional interior mapping thing analogous to a nervous system? Or what is it that brings it into the first level of what we would call psychology? Lovely. Uh, from a uh, Utah perspective, <clears throat> uh, what you are getting, and you can delineate it in time, uh, you get the potential buildup pre Cambrian explosion. Okay. And what you see is you see the emergence of, you get you know, essentially plants, you get fungi, and we can talk about fungi, they're mycologists studying the way, you know, mushrooms and all that other, they're very, it's a whole different animal kingdom, but neither one of them have a nervous system, okay, and neither one of them behave as a function of sensory motor looping, okay, in the, in real time, sensory motor looping in real time that produces a functional effect on the animal environment relationship is the epicenter pattern of mental behavior. Okay. And what you can then trace it, you see the, just the evolution of neurons and neural networks, which give rise to a way of coordinating the animal's activity. Look at a jellyfish. Okay. These neurons also have the capacity to sense, detect environmental changes in a much faster way and a distance way than cells, which basically are chemical based. Okay. So you get things like light detection. All right. And that affords things like eye spots. So we go from jellyfish into eye spots and a bilateral plan, okay, and a planaria worm. A planaria worm then has a head and then it moves. So now we've gone from nervous system step one that has both motor and sensory aspects. Motor and sensory aspect gets embedded in a body that then starts to be able to move as a whole in a direction, okay? And then you get two more steps in the Cambrian explosion. You get a consolidation of a segmented body, like it's got legs, okay, it's got a head that moves, organized sensory systems, and then a consolidated brain, a centralized control system. By the time you get a centralized control system, segmented body, you're getting mental behavior, okay? Which is the coordinated behavior of the animals as a whole, not saying anything about whether or not it has subjective consciousness. That's right. a whole nother question. But animals like bees and ants and flies behave totally differently than even Venus fly traps, Okay. The, the mushrooms and the, and the trees do not get up and walk around. And the getting up and walking around is the core. Right. And the argument is that, that that opens up a whole new complex adaptive plane of existence that has its own information network, the nervous system, and communication systems, animal to animal communication. That's a complex adaptive plane in the tree of knowledge. And that's mind happens at the Cambrian explosion. Right. So the threshold for mind is not nervous system and mobility. It's segmented body mobility and centralized control locus within a nervous system. 
Exactly. And I haven't always been crystal clear on that because I, I, it took me a little while to really delineate the full steps and then to realize what gives rise to the complexity building feedback group that really spawns the mental dimension of complexity. But there are a lot of parts to it and then it gets consolidated. And I believe the Cambrian explosion, the reason the Cambrian explosion happens is because basically it gets consolidated where you get animal on animal movement. An animal on animal movement, like prey predation movement, creates a totally different adaptive problem. And then that gives the arms race to the behavioral investment systems. And that's why they then just rise out in their capacity to move sensory motor looping uh, in a totally different way. No, I appreciate that clarity because it's not like, I mean, there's so many ideas here that when a person listens to even a couple of discussions you're in, they don't always know where these exact spots are for the definitions. Uh, one thing that popped into my mind when you were saying that is because one of the things you did in approaching the problem of psychology was compare it to what physical medicine is doing, where there's a, at very least a rough agreement that what the topic of physical medicine is, is the human body. <laughs> but what does, um, what does, how is health defined medically? And what does that tell us, if anything, about how we would approach defining well-being psychologically? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Okay. <clears throat> so inside of medicine, uh, I'm going to oversimplify because there are other models here, uh, but inside medicine, there are two broad views of what medicine is about. Uh, one is about health uh, and, and the other is about biomedical disease. Okay. And there's a big deba debate. Are you a biomedical doctor or a biopsychosocial doctor? Engels delineates this biopsychosocial model. So here's the issue of health versus disease. The disease narrow view is this, the disease narrow view is that what we need, if we're physicians or medical doctors, what we do is we track the organization of biology, okay? That's what we're expertise at. That's what we know about. And that's what we can assess. We can develop functional models of biology built, for example, like, oh, we know the heart functions this way. We use evolution, physiology, anatomy to build our models of the way the proper biological systems of adaptation ought to work. You know, and whether I'm using a normative term or just a reference term, we can get into that, but the heart ought to work a fucking way. It's designed to pump blood, all of the valves and all of its muscles are designed to do that. And when it breaks, okay, the muscles cramp, you get a stroke, something cramps out, it now is dysfunctioning relative to the reference. And then that dysfunction creates other dysfunctions and then there's harm associated with that. A breakdown in biological function delineated as harm is a good definition for disease, okay? There's a lot of continuum and differentiation, but at an epicenter of sort of the ontology of what a disease is, it's a breakdown and dysfunction of a biological structure that then is referenced value-wise as harmful, okay? That's actually Jerome Wakefield's analysis. <clears throat> and I argue that's a good definition of what biomedical disease is about. And if you're a biomedical philosophy, you take a biomedical philosophy of medicine, its central concern is that breakdown, okay? Other doctors will come along and basically be like, well, wait a minute, we're concerned with a lot of things that stretch way beyond these narrow biological breakdowns. You get, you know, blood pressure, is that a breakdown? You get continuum issues. We're concerned about obesity. We're concerned about toxins. We're concerned about ecology. The health professions clearly are not just concerned with a biomedical breakdown. So if you then expand a little bit outside of a narrow conception of, physiology, anatomy, evolutionary biology, structure function stuff, and just get into how things are. You get into this general biopsychosocial view where you get these broad concepts of distress and dysfunction, okay? And you get this continuum of biopsychosocial stress dysfunction. And that is another view of medicine where the, in fact, the World Health Organization is like, oh, our concern is well-being, and we'll come back to that, which is really this continuum of distress and dysfunction, broadly defined, across biological, psychological, and social levels. And all the health professions should get into that. Okay. Nursing is actually a profession that's organized around health. Its identity is actually taking care of a patient to cultivate health broadly. Nursing actually has that. It's arguable that medicine, with its commitment to biology, physiology, and anatomy, actually should be connected to biomedical. And we should have larger health conceptions that are not medical doctors. 
Now that's a problem institutionally because guess where all the fucking big dogs are in health world? <laughs> They're all MDs, okay? So institutionally, we have this interesting issue where the biomedical doctors also then became broad health doctors and then they became the top of health. It's actually, I've argued the, this for a while, it's actually nursing that should be the top of health professions, <laughs> because they're actually concerned with the health of the patient. That's actually what the nursing profession is fundamentally about. And they should then distribute us, us health professionals, across the proper organized layers of focus. So a nurse should take care of you, and then it should guide you when you need a medical doctor. It should guide you when you need a psychological doctor, and it should guide you when you need a social worker to manage social policy issues, to leverage various resources. And the social policy people, the psychological doctor, which is maladaptive behavior patterns, and the physiological doctor, which is breakdowns in your biology, are all then doctors that specialize in particular kinds of dysfunctions that lead to distress at different levels of analysis. Fantastic. And let's pay nurses more. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, but it's, so this is a call out to nurses. They should be ahead of the World Health Organization or whatever organization after it's got a little bump by COVID. But that's another story. <laughs> One of the things that um, leaps out at me as a religion guy is the sort of analogy between this set of emergent dialogical functions that must be taken into account in a useful model of the psyche and the classical complex insights heuristically embedded in pagan pantheons, mm -hmm. right? They had this way of tracking transnatural forces and entities and felt they needed this whole set in order to describe reality well and to figure out how to appease or negotiate or relate properly to these different forces to totally. establish the flourishing of the kingdom. You know, do we need to be pagans again with a good conscience? Does your model offer us something in the way of a, a sane religiosity by intelligibly presenting the mandala of powers that must be participatorily appeased to establish our thriving and salvation? Fuck yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is something that I learned as an atheist and, and then became, you know, uh, an atheistic agnostic synthist, <laughs> you know, basically. And by synthist, you know, it's a, certainly a nod to our friend Alexander Bard. Uh, but really, my just short version is, hey, we need to believe in the concept of God, you know, uh, and that's crucial. And, and, and what I mean by that is the concept of God affords a certain kinds of collective intelligence structures and orientations, trans justificatory structures and orientations that can knit together a stack of processes and coordinate those stack of processes at intuitive levels, at mythic narrative levels, that does all sorts of different kinds of absolutely crucial functions that the shaman would pick up on or the pagan religious, religious traditions would pick up on. Things like the cyclical functioning of the earth, you know, and our collective sense of tragedy or triumph, uh, archetypal structures. I mean, the whole reason I initially I didn't know really why I was called to call it the tree of knowledge originally. Um, that was more intuitive, um, but I certainly wanted to make a spiritual scientific leap link when I called uh, the you know, original diagram set of tree of knowledge. When I came back and turned it into a garden and put the tree of knowledge on the tree of, as the first branch of the tree of life that we need to live it off of, by this time, my evolution in the appreciation of a science spirituality um, bridge the need for a mythopoetic grand narrative that as you know and Jordan Peterson highlights this a lot and he gave me a lot of insight in the need to appreciate these archetypes and why there there's more than stories in relationship to psychology and our need to just sort of mystically engage in them is absolutely essential and one of the great meaning crisis problems that natural science and, and empiricism and Dawkins-esque atheism, you know, grossly misses and, and just and just and turns God into a delusion as if the idea of God is a delusion. You know, that's a that's a horrible error. And and I'm no, I'm, you know, I'm impoverished relative to you in this regard. I don't understand the great religious traditions. I was born into a place that devalued them. You know, that's my own minimal, you know, my, my own immaturity and my own, you know, shame to overcome. Uh, because it's a fundamental to revalue that and to reintegrate that domain of being and way of being and way of thinking is absolutely central. And my whole, the whole you talks a religion that's not a religion and a nod to a lot of that. I'm going to probe that a little bit more because there's a classic philosophical question around God, which is how do we know God is good? Uh -huh. right, so I'm going to ask it in a 
in the world's most arcane possible way. <laughs> is it your view that the root structure of something like an analytic or functional non-duality, whatever unit of thought permits dialogical transjectivity to operate, should be A, privileged in our model building and B, considered to be coincident with normativity itself? <laughs> um, th this is a view I'm coming into through my con continued contact with John. Okay, so this is, I would say, I think that John would definitely say uh, un unhesitantly and unfailingly yes to that view. I am, that's a much more, that's a more neoplatonic view uh, than my tr normal neo Aristotelian view, which is, which is more naturalistic and pragmatic, at least in relationship to the kind of claims about the divine, as opposed to embodying the divine in the particular process of being itself. Okay, um, but I am finding myself. Uh, you know, I, I, and when it comes to these views, I'm an in coherent, integrated pluralist, okay, which means pluralism, we're going to position ourselves and aspectualize different features of reality based on different language systems, socio historical perspectives, etc. And we'll be grounded in that. And inevitably, there's going to be a lot of then diversity and difference, okay, in the framing and emphases and things like that. There's a coherent integration, which means across the differentiation, these parts can sync up, and you can clearly see an overarching whole and pattern. Uh, so while the emphasis there is a little stronger than I would have originally given, it's mu much closer to that than I was three years ago in that framing. And three years from now, who knows? Maybe I'll be a true neoplatonist in relationship <laughs> to that structure and embrace that fully. I am, I'm an agnostic when it comes to foundationalism. So I, know I don't make any ontological claims about the divine. OK, um, but I don't make any anti ontological claims either, other than, you know, I'll dispute silliness. Um, but in relationship to foundational ontological claims, I sit in an agnostic and discovering place and find and expecting I will die there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's very sensible because as intense as it is to experience a normativity that seems to describe itself to you as foundational, that's always something that you can doubt in hindsight. Uh, but whether normativity is foundational in the model, it's certainly present as a direction in the model that can be produced, Definitely. right? When you say you're a coherent integrative pluralist, coherence and the integration of plurality seems to be a direction. I've got my little, <laughs> my diagram notes from listening to your talk up on the screen, and it's got a little virtue and vice arrows, <laughs> And the totally. virtue arrow points in the direction of coherence and integration, because I think of a virtue as an enactment of multiple values simultaneously. You're kind of weaving them together. And a vice is something that pursues a value at the expense of other values. Lovely. So that's a disintegrating versus an integrating approach. And if we're moving, if health and well-being are conceived as integrative, then they're inherently conceived as normative. Totally. Yep. No, I, that's a hundred percent. Weaving the normative in has been a, is a great challenge, um, but certainly the evolution of the tree of knowledge to the garden. Uh, actually, the coin helps with this, and then the icon of the elephant sun god is the ultimate concern. And basically, it just however you'd want to represent it. It's a you know, it's a the simplest way is it represents the transcendent values of goodness, truth, and beauty relative to the evil. It's ant antithetical, dark, destructive, ugly, evil. Okay. And, and that continuum, the argument is that there's a universal sensibility among typical humans that afford the capacity to generally see that outline, <laughs> you know, that our, our structure, our transjective structure of being in the world affords us this capacity to see the outline because we see the way the world unfolds. If you, you know, elevate Hitler and want to kill all the Jews, you're on a train to Auschwitz in a particular kind of way. And then the overall structure of that ugly, disintegrated, incoherent nastiness riddled with suffering is fundamentally different than a family filled with love around the Thanksgiving table or whatever narrative, you know, there's always then, well, is that good for the turkey? You know, I mean, there's always layers that you can place in it, but there are fundamental arcs of value uh, and ultimate concern and new diamonic endpoints that are, that, that make the normative a lot more than just, oh, I say it's good. You know, there's a, that is a shitty justification for genuine normative thought. And we can do a lot richer and better and, and delineate it, uh, at least at a coherent, integrated, pluralistic, transjective um, view. 
It's uh, I think one of the challenges we all face is whether to think of the normative as a as a cluster or as having some basic underlying structure. Yeah. So when you talk about, I mean, if a patient comes to you and they want to feel better and be more functional while they're committing serial rapes, yep. right? You're going to play that off against a, a collective normativity about how our social world has to be handled. Cool. So we're looking at well-being in a way that includes these different classes of normativity. But are we just saying? Look, here's the set of normativities we have to include in order to have a definition of well-being. Or is there some way to say that those are somehow the same and that, you know, in, 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 that the that the person who wants to be a better rapist is in error somehow and not just simply doing one rather than doing both? I, th- I find this to be a profound challenge and an interesting set of questions. Um, and, um, you know, the the. I'll punt on this a little bit and then we can maybe dialogue a little bit about what actually uh, the, the issue is. So, you know, the, the strong the, the couple of things. So the argument in relationship to morality from to just the categories, an absolutist morality argues that it exists prior to and independent of human belief system writ large. This is Star Wars, whereby you have, OK, there's light and dark forces and underneath it all, there's an actual ontology. And you can say that the rapist is embracing the dark side. And that, 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 that that's a definable feature objectively of the universe, independent of any transjective iterative construction on the part of the knower. Mm-hmm. And then the extreme subjective is, no, it's all just bullshit. And you, I say the elephant sun god is good. And you say the raping is good and we're all fine. And it's just a matter of opinion. OK, and I'm definitely arguing neither one of those is right. OK, so our, if we're, if we're going to try to create it's all in the head versus it's completely independently specified. I'm going to argue that there is an iterative process when it comes to normative structure that's going to put no or no relation. And then you have to actually put no or no relationship across the values that it specifies and then put it in time and then see what diverges and then make a judgment. Okay. Um, So what that means is, is that if you were, I would say, if somebody were, somebody could develop a coherent philosophy that basically advocates a value structure for raping that then is then oriented in a particular way and structured in a particular way, that would be very hard for me to say that that is wrong in an absolute sense, okay? Now, I would argue that almost certainly, however, the set of assumptions that they're making are gonna have many errors in them that are not normative, but analytic. I would argue that uh, Hitler, enormous number of Hitler's justifications about the nature of the Jewish race, okay? were completely errant constructions about reality that they're in utilized to legitimize. Um, but they find if you actually undergird, undercut the logic and showed its inaccuracy, a lot of the fallaciousness happens. So I think you can bring a lot to the analytic deconstruction of systems and show many of them to be wrong in the analytic sense. The question though is, could you develop a systematic, analytically correct and internally coherent element that affords particular transjectives that moves in this direction for the individual that's kind of consistent? That's a very complicated question so that you can then, can you develop? I argue you can't really develop an absolutist perspective on wrong in an analytic sense. We can develop a universalist constructivist perspective on wrong and put that bastard in jail, you know? Um, So there's a, so that's the, I don't know if that's a short answer, but I, it's a really complicated question that I've wrestled <laughs> yeah, with for a long time. <laughs> that's a complex, moderate length non-answer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, I started with a non-answer and I ended with one. And, uh, but it's, but it's I am a, I do really embrace normative. Question. <laughs> I think we all intuitively feel like there must be some way to make the clarification a little bit more intrinsic. I would agree. Um, yeah, with that. what we can do pragmatically is simply say this is the set of things we need to include. I have found I have found putting clarifying the underlying value, clarifying the under accuracy concerns, and then putting those values in transjective relation gets moves us in the right direction. I'll say that, but it, it I, could be more specific. <laughs> or, I, or I have a hard time seeing how to do it without putting directionality at the core of the enterprise, right? Mm. One of the questions that comes up in Buddhism huh. is what, right? Yeah. How do emptiness and compassion relate to each other? Right. Because right? compassion is going to change and improve you and emptiness is just emptiness. Totally but if you nice. take out that idea and go, well, it's not just, it's not just there. If we assume what you're describing is an experiential condition that can be achieved or moved toward over time that we've just called emptiness, Right now, that's going to feel wrong to a lot of the instincts of people who want to make a fundamentalist 
you know, a foundational absolutist claim about what they're working with. But if you think, well, this person with their rapist ideology, what they're doing is closing down future possibilities for the pluralistic expansion reintegration of what they're doing. And then they're going to be, or conversely, like Hitler's approach to the Jews, what always strikes me is those were German Jews. This was a subset of the German population. So in a way, the cultural field with which he identifies is breaking itself down in a regressive, semi-suicidal move. And of course, it ends in suicide for him. He's anti-German in a way. But when we yeah. look at these trajectories of where it could go further yeah. along the well-being or further back, I think then we have a better way to do it. But it takes the risk of moving us out of the ontological givens into a very constructivist model of reality. And not everyone wants to take that risk. That's just, that does work exactly where I find myself, but, but, but a, but with, for me, with the transjective developmental across time dynamic and comparison across transjective trajectories, you, I feel far less, uh, I feel, yes, it's constructionist in a particular sort of way, but it's a grounded constructionist that carries a lot more weight of, of sort of justification uh, that it doesn't feel like it's, you know, trapped in a subjective because I say so. That I, I can't remember who I mentioned this to the other day, but in, in Gurdjieff, there's a parable of the two creations of the world, huh. right? So normativity makes a universe and it beholds the universe. He calls this auto egocrat. It just yeah. sees everything and I made it and I'm good. <laughs> and therefore it's good. And therefore I'm good. It's all good. Hey, it sounds good to me. <laughs> the problem is it immediately starts to break down. The mere passage of time causes the entropy to build up. And pretty soon you have counter normative trends in the mm. originally perfect system. So God has to destroy the universe and make another one that he calls the mm. Trogo auto egocratic system, where it generates divinity by everything reciprocally eating everything else. <laughs> huh. Okay. Right? So the natural tendency of normativity to become counter normativity is itself countered by establishing normativity as a constant mutual building up creative process. I like that. So that's a very nice model. And it shows you something about the static normativity. I think uh, Gary said this at one point, right? This idea that static normativity almost inherently starts to deviate into its opposite. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Totally. Well, I mean, that's very, the, the, the tree of knowledge in its depiction of an unfolding wave of complexification away from entropy that stacks on itself through consumption in a particular way, but then spreads out higher networks of coherent adaptive integration. I mean, from a scientific descriptive standpoint, it's not too many steps away from that. Well, speaking of trees, one thing that I'm, I'm sure is included in your thought, but which doesn't necessarily come out in an emphasized way in the presentations is the normativity outside of the human social domain. Right. So we go, yeah, you've got the individual's normativity and you've got the social normativity. But what about what about a person who's um, beloved and makes everyone happy and follows the rules, but nonetheless is destroying the environment? Uh -huh. Right. H how do we describe that as pathological, whether it's the bias <clears throat> or even some greater you know, cosmo bio scenario? How do we take that into account norm normatively and also include it in our definition of well-being? Totally. Well, uh, so the nested model, the one with the rings uh, back here, uh, basically is a descriptive metaphysical system for at least getting us clear uh, about the variable domains that go into the concept of well-being. And then after that clarity, we can then ask certain kinds of questions about it. And what it says is, is that you need a sentient being in the beginning. You need a psyche, essentially. Uh, if you don't have a psyche at all, uh, then the, at least this particular referent for well-being uh, is up in the air, you know, so then, well, can trees have well-being? Well, in relationship to the nested model, uh, that's a complicated question, okay? Uh, but then you basically, you certainly have the inside-out epistemic vector, okay, that then is organized by the psychological and, uh, and biological structures, meaning I have a psyche that's organized in my psychological structure, all my mental functions, that then embedded in my biological structure as an organism, Okay. And then I'm embedded in a material and social environment. Okay. And that what we can do is we can analyze causal explanatory and descriptive dynamics that make claims about whether or not I've got adaptive functionality and am feeling satisfied or not around that relation. Okay. And then you place that in an overarching 
value structure, an ideological structure that then uses to reference well, what kind of agent arena relations are good and what kind are bad. And that requires in particular then evaluation, a proscriptive normative valuation in relationship to the, re the relations. And then that should be placed over time, both historically and then in the future. Okay. So then the issue is, well, okay, yeah, what do you actually value? All right. And then you would then play out the role. Uh, in fact, this just came up on my theory of knowledge list where we were trying to then say, well, how do you value human lives in relationship to other animal lives? Okay. Is it okay to eat meat? And under what circumstance? Uh, what does that mean about how do you evaluate what, uh, animal welfare? Is it okay to eat meat of the last dying extinct creature to kill it, hunt it, and eat it? How would you reference that? What would be the poison which you would have somebody say, oh my God, to cause a species to go extinct? You know, how do we value that? Like what, what, for the person that says, oh my God, this is unbelievably horrible. This, is, this affords, you know, this is a, a ruining of, of nature's arc. And others are like, who cares? It's just a kind of squirrel. Okay. How would you actually specify that? Uh, I don't, I, that's a much richer, nuanced, detailed depth perspective. I don't have the capacity to instantaneously know from a universalist perspective, um, but I can frame that with the nested model and then embrace particular kinds of dialogos processes and evaluative processes and engagement processes to try to cultivate the best analysis of uh, adaptive value based living in the short and long term. Yeah, I appreciate that you're bringing in time scales there, because it seems to me in, in the world, when I hear conversations about things like well-being and pathology, they seem so relative to time scales. Uh, and yet it's so seldom discussed because most of the models they're using don't really have a place for multiple different layers of temporal extension to have a role. I remember that somebody told me, and I wish I were more of a Greek scholar to either know who or whether it was bullshit, but, but there was a sense of like, when you asked, did somebody leave a good life? You know, the answer was, it's way, too, you know, even after they died, a lot of yeah. them, like, it's way too early to tell. <laughs> you know, it's like, we need like four generations out to answer that question. So that's an interesting angle. I'm putting it in deep time, you know, to see kind of where yeah, does this yeah. fit? There's a, in, a in similar thing I was just reading. I sent Bruce this book, which is a, uh, about a scholar who goes over to China to try to get a sense of what the historical life of Bodhidharma was like, mm. apart from the legends. And he tells this joke he runs into a lot among Chinese people who say, well, where are you from? And the guy says, Guangzhou province. He says, well, when was the last time you were back there? And he says, four generations ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. There you go. Right. You know, the arc of life, uh, it, it needs to, you know, your evaluation has got to be at least be conscious of the time frame you're putting on it. That's for sure. Yeah. And that might be, it's a weird thing because agricultural populations may have a better sense of uh, extended well-being than we do because we don't have oh, to totally. deal with anticipating these longer cycles all the time. Totally. Well, we're, and we're just basically discontinued from history in many ways as a function of yeah. the, you know, no, and we've realized how to profit changes. from selling ourselves much shorter time spans. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I want to get this year's Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and quick. <laughs> God. Something's coming up for me around like soma, around like the all over interceptive experience of the body, which is something that's not always articulated as central, but certainly is practically central to a lot of spiritual training systems. Definitely. And I'm curious about the role it plays in different phases and different aspects of the psyche. Like we've talked about, you know, the the kind of mirror phase like phenomena, whatever it is that advanced animals can do, yep. recognizing this is my body sort of mm -hmm. apart totally. from the group. And then that shift to human beings who are able to narratively and symbolically represent themselves. And one of the things that seems to come up for a lot of people in, in spiritual practice is when they spend a lot of time sitting or being the body or something, some kind of bodily practice, a lot of that um, self image and storytelling stuff falls away starts they start to shift into the um subjective embodiment as a primary psyche mode of some kind absolutely and i'm curious using your model which i think is really well clarified with the experiential and the persona mm -hmm. and the ego and the different filter problems between them but when you like what's going on there if a person is increasing their experiential access to things that are going on inside their body 
And then they're shifting their ego's story about who they are so that that interior experience becomes more of their self-definition. And then maybe it shows up in the persona in terms of bearing themselves a little bit differently to others. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Like no, that. this is great. Uh, this has been a big, this has been an area of development and it fits right in with the, the psyche that comes along to try to capture it. Okay. So I used to call this thing called the experiential self. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which I didn't predominantly identified as the primate self. Uh, I'm doing it in psychotherapy and the epicenter then of the primate self is this relational system that, that mapped by the matrix, which is you're tracking yourself in your tribe, whether you're seen, known, and valued, what's your power dynamics, what's your love dynamics, what's your freedom dynamics, and how, you know, what's your history of attachment and all of this, which by the way is fucking central. Okay. <laughs> and in psychotherapy, this is the a central feature that we're really dragging with. And, and what the updated tripartite model captures is, oh, is this dimension of the primate, okay, relative to the ego, relative to the persona and the self dynamics where they've been filtering in defense. And all of that's good. But the question is, well, where does that primate self come from? Okay. And although I had delineated through the tree of knowledge, I didn't specify until I really got with John and talked more and more clearly about the recursive relevance realization systems of complex adaptive functioning across the time scales and the networks of adaptation. So now here's where I go. I say, okay, well, underneath the primate self, now I can say is the mammal, okay? And underneath the mammal is the animal, and underneath or around the animal is the organism, okay? So now the I've essentially- experiential self is a stack now. It's well. a stack now, okay? And of course, this would be, the Indian people would laugh at me and basically like, you didn't know that? <laughs> you know, like a chakra? You know, I was like, come on. You know, what do you like, think oh, we've been carving into these uh, totem poles all yeah, the time? You right? know, come on. <laughs> you know, like you Westerners, fucking Jesus, propositional network people. You know, God, get into the fucking life and body. So anyway, but now that's essentially, you know, and yes, that's my own expansion. It shows our propositional narrative emphasis. This is Ian McGilker's all, you know, so many people make this claim and I'm certainly a part of this. So, oh, true propositional knowledge and you abstract everything else and you live in your fucking head. Okay. Well, now the experiential self. So, the, so now I can go basically this is like, okay. So first off, we have the internal working model. That's the primate stuff, the matrix model, and I just like primate heart. Okay. Then underneath that is your mammal attention system. Just where are you sharing your attention? What the hell are you surprised by? What are you looking at? What are your focus? What's the balance between your task network and your default mode network to bring attention into your world? Okay. The epicenter is your ego and then you're holding the self, but the mammals bouncing around to aspectualize the world in a particular way and bring attention. Okay. So when you ask yourself to meditate, you're actually it's the mind's eyes, really, in this case, the mammal mind's eye that's looking around. Okay. And then underneath that's the animal, okay? Meaning about the Cambrian explosion, when's the first dimension of mentation really getting, and then we're going to say, well, the early version of psyche consciousness, okay? Uh, mind to consciousness. And my argument and many, uh, you know, neurobiological, evolutionary biological people essentially say what's going on is this. Once the Cambrian explosion happens, you get basically a participatory movement system. That's then identifying its place as a prey or predator against another prey or predator. You then have this online sensory motor looping. And that online sensory motor looping connects the position of the exterior world in your relation. So you see, okay. And then it measures that against the interiority, interoception. Okay. That's the position of your loins and your gut. You're going to eat, <laughs> you're going to flee, you're going to fuck. Okay, so your loins and gut check the relation, and that's the interior felt sense. And then it activates proprioception, which is the whole moody movement of the body. Okay, and that yokes together the early forms of perception, which is detecting the exterior sense, interoception, which is how's the state of my body. Okay, and then emotion, energized motion towards something. Okay. So now what we have then is this embodied system, which is yo at the early phases of animal, is taking a gest body gestalt and saying, hey, is this inner, uh, uh, exterior, inner, and movement relationship good, which then becomes pleasure, okay? And is it, or bad, and should I spend more actively or should I conserve more passively, okay? So you get this active, passive, pleasure, pain, which by the way, is called the circumplex model of affect. 
that then is the fundamental interface between the core of the animal psyche, its base of valence qualia and activation, and the organism itself. Okay. So now what does that mean is now, well, that's the interface between your psyche and the embodiment. Okay. And then the process by which that's interfacing. So the metaphor that I'm using here is like the body, the, the consciousness sits like in the center of a stadium. And then the nervous system is like all of the pieces of the, you know, all the audience members. And then the stadium itself is the body. Okay. And so now the body then is interfacing with the audience as the nervous system, which then has a spotlight of consciousness. And what we want to try to do is we want to try to open up that structure and so now for me, as somebody who's hyper-intellectualized, I spend a lot of time checking out my body, bring the mammal attentional structure through the pleasure pain and ask, hey, do I feel secure? What part of this part of my body is metabolizing in this neuromuscular, you know, consuming, digestive, hormonal system? And what fundamentally is it telling me about safety and security versus threat, pleasure, pain, active, passive? And it's about, so to me, then this is expanding the animal somatic interface, um, which I would argue that I certainly have neglected and many, of course, wisdom traditions have pointed along to, to so if you want to ground and expand the psyche, that's, that's where you talk has taken me to drop into mammal, animal, into body. And the layering of that really is the stadium organizational structure. And we got to expand the resonance uh, and do so, you know, through somatic attention. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of a Rogers thing, I guess, which is how often that gets lost in the interplay between persona. Totally. And uh, especially in an area, uh, an age where we've got amped up social media, which is essentially you're, you're constantly socializing. You're staying at the gossip level all the time. It's very frustrating and drives you away from the elements of embodied intelligence that proposed to be the future of your well-being and development. Exactly. So yes, the Rogerian notion of an organismic valuing process, basically, and now Rogers was probably made or maybe some overshooting claims about that. If you grant that the right environment, it will always grow towards its potential. But certainly was absolutely correct that if you have a judgmental person social management system that is constantly laying contingencies on this structure and secondarily punishing it for what's an initial exploration felt sense of being you are you're going to create a psychic structure uh, that is fragile vulnerable at war with itself etc there's the um i mean the critical judgmental element of the persona interactions is interesting but there's also a danger that goes along with the pleasing persona. I recently watched this documentary about Bill Cosby. It was great. It was called We Need to Talk About Cosby. And it really, I think, does a deft job um, moving back and forth between this powerful progressive role in, in the political and economic situation of Black mm-hmm. people over the course mm-hmm. of the 20th century and right. its very specific form of compulsive sexual predation. Mm-hmm. And in a way, that's sort of that's straightforward, right? You see, oh, there's monster. You got to side Mm -hmm. with the victims. Of course, one of the things that puzzled me is the position taken by the Mm non-victims, right? For the victims, it's awful, but for the non-victims who are shocked, traumatized, I can't believe it. How could a wealthy, (laughs) successful person in America be up to no good? I can't, right? Because on paper, you would assume that Right. If you just saw, well, he's a rich, famous American power player. They, of course, he's probably doing something shady. <laughs> but but people watch this show and they go, look how much he leans into this role, the persona of the warm educator patriarch. Right. Totally. The people grew up with Bill Cosby. And somehow I can't reconcile that persona, which is so positive with yep. any negative information. Right. And yet I should make this assumption about human beings. And also, why would I have evolved to um, mistake positive personae for safety when positive personae are always deployed on purpose to protect predation? Mm. Have I evolved to be food for <laughs> these people? <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, you know, th- that is such a fascinating uh, story. And then the, if we try to deconstruct that, you know, in relationship to, you know, uh, that this is, by the way, the problem of justification 
the argument is, is that this is exactly what this exemplifies. And what I mean by that is, is that other animals are tracking behavior, okay, in a particular kind of way, and they're communicating in their bedding. And of course, other animals can deceive. But the line of being in a, as a persona, um, whereby you're going to then regulate and then gain access and, re- and, and uh, misconstrue uh, what it is that you're actually doing, explodes when you get this idea that you have this highway just to the subjective through your language. So I can now say, this is what I am to you. And I can now create all of these explanations. And at the same time, you have, there, there's some places you have huge amounts of access to, and then other places you still are unbelievably difficult to gain access to my private thoughts, right? So this capacity for deception, and then the navigation of how are we actually going to find the true patriarch, okay, that actually has through their stack, their organismic valuing process has as part of them, they're oriented towards the affiliation, the other oriented structurally, and they're there to take care. And they're actually there as opposed to the predator, especially the deceiving predator, which will drop in there, mimic all of that, and then be the other. And at the same time, also know that humans actually are capacity for cultivating a persona, which Cosby really feels like he is that, and then justifies the split off, hides himself in a dark room and is like, I'm also this, but I'll minimize that and create actually an identity where the structure is split along the lines. So that so he believes himself as, you know, the Bill Cosby show guy. And at the same time, knows he's also this, but dissociates from it in a particular way. So even our psyche structures essentially are that designed to try to weave our way through this kind of complex network of like, well, who's going to trust us and who can we betray? <laughs> so then there's a there's an interesting well-being question here, which is involves trade-offs, right? There's a trade-off between being vigilant about the fact that persona, especially in a marketing culture, uh, is potentially deceptive and often veils predation. And the amount of anxiety and distress and um, bad conscience you have to live through if you were to assume that all the time about everyone. So from the point of view of psychological health, what's the appropriate amount of suspicion towards persona and um, deployments of persona technologically? I mean, this is a very, very central. Uh, And so... I'll put it this way. Often when it goes bad, the way they people manage it is splitting in extremes. And this is manifest most obviously in what we call borderline personality disorder. Okay. So borderline personality disorder are individuals who then have this very strong combination of attempting to fuse to find their savior on the one hand and being fucking betrayed by everybody. Okay, And what happens then is what we call splitting, where they then to try to navigate both the need, the dependency needs to be involved and cared for and and all of that, and also to protect oneself from absolute betrayal, obligations, other kinds of control. Okay, we have to we're managing both sides of this coin. And when you see it done poorly, you get borderline or borderline personality is the example where it's done poorly, where the system essentially has two switches. I'm all in, I'm going to create barriers. And then all of a sudden, if the right things happen and I decide that Layman Pascal is my fucking savior, then you're in. And now I'll drop you in and say, oh my God, thank God I found you. And you're my Bill Cosby for all. Okay. And you will be my protective father. And now I'll fuse with you. And now I'll do all of this. And then all of a sudden, of course, that's going to idealistic things going to shatter. And then I'll realize that, oh my God, I now hate you. So classic, I love you. I hate you in relation. All right. Um, so that's an example of how not ideally to go about managing this dialectic. Okay. We can then flip that around and basically say, Hey, there has to be an iterative and developmental process. Okay. By which individuals navigate their own self-determination from a healthy autonomous perspective so that you actually are, can be grounded in dependency in yourself in a reasonable way. And at the same time, you must, you are also interdependent. And then are in the process of finding out ways in which you can build mutually dependent relations, okay, that grant effective freedoms when people need to bolt, but also build a particular mutual structure of understanding. And this is the green line balance. And the argument is, is that individuals can manage healthy autonomy and interdependence are essentially trying to manage all of the dynamics of the self and the ego and the persona together and trying to get you know, like in some of my close relations, uh, I try to have a principle of unfiltered, okay? The unfiltered principle, 
What do I mean by that? It means that when I get a negative reaction and have a judgment, okay, I'm going to, and, it, and it's activated enough so it's consciousness, I got to bring it to the person I'm into it with and tell them. Okay. So here we had this exchange. And although I care about you, afterwards, I kept thinking that was fucking incompetent of you. Okay. All right. Now, from a Rogerian perspective, oh my God, how do we manage that? Well, actually, Rogers does help you figure out ways in which you would actually afford the opportunity to recognize my organismic valuing process. Experience this as uh, you're incompetent. Now, of course, as soon as that gets delivered, the si other system's like, oh my God, you're judging me and this is horrible. The question, though, really is not, I'm going to bring this as a judgment in some absolute sense, but I will bring my organismic valuing negative process to you so you can see and we can see what does it actually mean. And then we'll hold a metabolic process so that these potential negatives are situated between us and we mutually metabolize them. Okay. Yeah. To the extent that you can do that, you get wisdom, I argue, you get wisdom stack integration. Okay. And that is my shadow shit. My animal stuff, my judgment shit, all of our stuff can actually be dropped into the system and then have the whole calm MO things actually. Well, if you're curious, you're accepting, we're going to put it in. We're not going to have negative reactions to these negative feelings. We're just going to drop them in and then see what metabolizes between us. Okay. If you can do that, then it affords the intersubjective coordination, okay, toward mutuality um, in a way that I think is much deeper, richer, robust. Uh, than many systems where you're basically, okay, I'm going to advertise, I'm going to market. What I really want you to do is buy this thing you fucking don't need, <laughs> get you to sell it, get your money, and then I'll get on to the next thing. I mean, that's the exact, that's the exact structure then uh, for systematic deceit and limited grounding in the uh, relational architecture across time. So instead of a prescriptive statistic like 20% suspicion, 80% trust, we're looking at a skill building capacity, uh, which should allow us to manage those things, but which only really occurs when people can bring mutually explorative critique to each other. I, I would, at an intimate level, you definitely would need that aspect. I also think that ultimately, the other there are lots of obligations here or reflective opportunities for obligation, like what kind of societal message are we going to set? Societies can build people that lean more toward the antisocial manipulative or build people that lean more towards the affiliative, you know, sensitive or, or trustworthy or whatever we want. So there's, there's a lot of stacking to that. But at the dyadic developmental interpersonal process, like how do I as a person try to navigate this? Because I totally want to cultivate healthy, autonomous, interdependent relationships that are built on mutually bound coherence across the stack of our psyches. If I do that, I'm going to be in a very different place uh, than if I'm just running from, you know, conventional manipulative exchange to conventional manipulative exchange. Uh, given your impression of what the world is like, would you say that your kids are a little too trusting or a little too suspicious? Which, which, which way would you slightly correct them given the world? That's a great question. I haven't necessarily put it in those terms. I like the fact that I can't instantaneously tell you that they're wrong on one you know, side. We, we just other. had a moment of silence. That's not uh, common. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So I started to differentiate. Well, my son is a little too trusting and good hearted in some ways, but he learned a few lessons and matured there. My daughter is a little too judgmental and suspicious here, but I think she's opened up over there. So I'll simply say I, I actually am finding myself, you know, feeling pretty good as a parent, thinking through the development of my children and hearing an, a, a, what I think is generally a constructive opponent process around this dialectic in most cases. Um, and I don't know that I can say readily in any of them, actually, that clearly they err on the side of you know, gullible naivete and, you know, humans are good or are, you know, bitter, you know, Hobbesians who, <laughs> who expect themselves to get eaten by the world in a particular way. There was a, a question in one of the episodes of Psyche Pathology that uh, Gary asked, and I thought it was a good question. I, I felt like John had a strong moral response to it that might have blocked Gary from fully unfolding what his question was. And it was around, is it all, is truth always indicated 
as the therapeutic mechanism. I think he talked a bit about, you know, Lacan and the psychotic and whether you tell them the truth and things like that. But also there's yeah. this question of, you know, what is the truth and what's it being true to? There's a lot of different ways to handle that. But, you know, what's your take on that? To what degree do we assume that making the patient or the other person recognize truth is inherently healing? And when might it not be? It's yeah. Uh, I didn't have a strong a reaction to that question. Uh, and I don't know whether it's my philosophy or my <laughs> role as a therapist or whatever. Yes. I'm, I certainly, the truth's one of the great transcendence, uh, but I situate my ultimate justification, be that which enhances dignity and well-being with integrity. Integrity is my truth function, my epistemic commitment to these kinds of issues, but it's also juxtaposed against dignity and well-being and juxtaposed against it sometimes, you know, uh, so that I definitely do not see uh, so I'll give you an example. I mean, a really clear case came up as I was supervising five years ago or whatever, and we're in the midst of a therapy session and we're getting, there were a lot of indicators that there was a, you know, some weird sexual dynamics going on with this guy. Um, and we started to get into that and we started to get into what it was and, and really try to create an open relationship so we could be honest and peer shine the flashlight. Okay. On what it is that this proclivity thing was about. And you know, what we discovered basically, is that, you know, he was a repressed pedophile. Yeah. So what's, <laughs> okay. So it's like, what I'm not like, yeah, you know, I was like, case, you know, like, okay, well, you know, I mean, pause, you know, all right, cut the tape, you know, it's like, right. okay, now what, you know, it's like, okay. I mean, welcome to the whole, right. uh, you know. And it's, it's not just, white uh, or black. It's to what degree and in what ways do we help him with that? Dude, I, I exposed, I, I haven't done this in a while, probably because I need to be more cautious. But when we were getting in, when we did this, we went and looked at NAMBLA. NAMBLA is the National Association for Man-Boy Love. There's an entire system of justification that says, hey, you guys have the wrong ideas about pedophiles. Okay. Um, so anyway, my point of it fundamentally is, is that if if the, the idea, certainly I've encountered truth awareness dynamics, okay, about particular traumas, about particular feeling states, about particular recognitions of your being in a particular way um, that I would argue may create what the emotion-focused therapy people call primary maladaptive responses. A primary, uh, most of the time, your emotions are primary adaptive. Like you can hold them and they shoot you a piece of information. If you can hold them and integrate them in a particular way, in fact, that's why you want to relate. But if you're traumatized by a particular thing or say your structure from the animal child into in relationship to the persona in the world that you live can be so fundamentally at odds and you gain insight into that structure that is not really fixable, okay? The simple idea that it's always best to go with the truth is too complicated for me uh, because there are too many examples where you could say, well, they opened up that truth and then that truth led to a whole fucking bunch of cascades. You know, there are a lot of people that use repression for good reasons. And it seems to be pretty clear that a lot of times we repress shit that we're actually in the short term and then it never comes back to bite us. We just avoid it. We don't think about it. And we and rather than ruminate or try to uncover or disclose, we basically, nah, I don't think it's right, <laughs> even though maybe it was, but we're going to move on uh, adaptively. And so certainly we would say, you don't have to have an obligation to always try to uncover the truth. And there would be maybe even cases of deep truth that actually threaten dignity and well-being uh, in particular ways. So I think it's a very complicated iterative, you know, dynamic and at times conflicting relation. Yeah. Well, at least to have the complexity, you know, on the table. And, I also, I mean, this, this, yeah. at a, and, and I'd like to talk more with John about this. I, I mean, the, this comes up in some ways in terms of depressive realism. In a simpler example, a depressive realism is moderately depressed people. This is college students who score high in a self-report, arguably are able to estimate their attractiveness, their competence, their outcomes more accurately than everyday people. And the argument is, is that everyday people have a basically their ego. Yeah. justifies their control, their competence, their attractiveness in as positive base rate as possible, but skewed toward the positive, the normative structure. Uh, I think there's some argument that's actually, yeah, that people walk around thinking themselves as better drivers, more attractive. There are a lot of reasons why these justification systems emerge, but a simple bias toward the positive explanation as part of a healthy ego functioning is not easy to dismiss 
And then it raises a number of complicated questions. No, if we're, um, I mean, if we're all doomed to some degree, <laughs> then merely acknowledging that is not necessarily superior to a system that allows you to feel good and have good relationships under the conditions of that doom. Um, we can at least juxtapose those two as important values. And that's where I get my well-being versus integrity, by the way. Yeah. That well-being is not always the same thing as integrity. And then there is some potential um, uh, tension and conflict between them. I was going to say a certain model of the psyche that came up for me while I was thinking about talking with you. And there's a there's part of me that's going to be kind of professional above board. And these are the sort of reasonable things a person might say on topics like these. And there's another part of me that just has very strange pictures of the world. And I'm interested in that part because I've known individuals, right? When you're in religious communities, you, you meet some of these people and they are, you know, I don't understand how much beingness this dude has. He's just radiating, but every word out of his mouth sounds like paranoid garbage to me. Mm -hmm. I don't understand. Has he has he moved? Has he taken the part of me that's not objective and mutually mm -hmm. vetted and, mm -hmm. and really grow on that part? And do you get these amazing results from that? So, mm -hmm. and then what, what's the future of my nonsense? That's an mm -hmm. interesting question to that me. That is interesting. Question. But as part of my, as, as possibly part of my nonsense, I was playing around. I'm like, what do I think the psyche looks like? And I thought of this thing I called the thermopsychic adjacency model, which okay. was like, I'm using heat as an analogy for the psyche. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So that the um, everything has some heat. Right. There's mm -hmm. something like subjective potential everywhere, even though it's gotcha. it, it might be something we call almost absolute zero. Right. Right. <laughs> but really, there's no real manifestation of absolute zero outside of a right. few narrow circumstances. Yep. Then you get up to the point of uh, mammals. Mammals already have a pretty good starting point because they got some kind of internal heat engine, mm -hmm. but that heat engine in cold circumstances of the world still requires you to put on insulative layering. Mm -hmm. And the more than psychoepistemological layers you put on top of this thing, the more ambient heat you get. So it seems like psyche is being intensified, which it is. There's more mm -hmm. ambient heat. Mm -hmm. And this heat can be transferred into different particular forms. If I hold mm -hmm. a cold spoon, my ambient heat's going in to heat the spoon. Likewise, I might lean some of this ambient thermal psyche into my memory or into a behavior, into a part of my body, into my self-reflection or my social presentation. Uh, and that this, I, so I'm thinking of it as an ambient swarm effect. Then I'm also conceiving the parts of the swarm as little you know, adjacency molecules. I call them moda because it's like no motors, motors and atoms sure. backward and iotas of material. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah, it's perfect. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm trying to bring up with that. I just thought I would mention it. <laughs> and also, I guess here's a curious question, aside from how do you feel about all that? But the question is, when we conceive of the psyche, do we conceive of it more as a container for these other functions, yep. as an emergent epiphenomenon of the interactions of these functions, or as something more fluid and swarm-like that can move into forms? Lovely. For me, it's, I mean, if we do sort of like the stadium with a spotlight and a number of activities going on, you're going to get metaphors across that structure. Um, so that's one side. Uh, the other thing that came up to me, so when you say, Heat, I wanted to add heat and light, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, heat creating sort of the potential energy and light going to be sort of the epistemic function that centers around. For me, psyche's fund. Why do we have psyche? Ultimately, it's an epistemic knowing function, okay? And that's what, uh, in other words, it's, it's, it's the organized information processing semantic systems that afford sense making. That's what it's going to yoke the stuff together. So it's like, Okay, the rocks will have heat potential, okay? But they're pretty fucking cold when it comes to psyche, all right? But then the idea that you can have heat potential that then affords the capacity to hold light, where light is sort of the epistemic function that brings heat together that affords the potential informational semantic coordination of that, okay? Then you sort of distribute, and then it's this energy information field, which is really the, I mean, that's what I'd say most ontologically description of the entire monistic universe is an energy information field across the structures. 
Uh, and at that level, then you get this continuity. And then there's a, there's a psyche, you know, uh, pan psychist quasi continuity function. If you do energy information fielding all the way down. So for me, that's the, that's what I was having sort of like, yeah, I mean, heat, uh, especially heat and light and electromagnetic radiation as a fundamental medium that actually is creating this capacity for interface across the stack. That's got a lot of resonance. I, I, I like the sound of that. There's a kind of perennial question, <laughs> which is how much, if at all, any of this applies to sociological domains. Right, which is it's it's too easy to use psychology to diagnose nations and businesses and things like that. But it's also there are many suggestive resonances, which makes us think maybe we should probe it in that way. Right? And there's something there are functions like pathology and functions like the unconscious that seem to go on in sociological enterprises. In particular, um, ideological functions people talk about hey look not just ideology as here's i say what i believe to other people and trying to influence the world but ideology in terms of i'm embedded in some kind of process and therefore i seem to have this opinion and i tell other people these things but really it's because you know i i, I want the money or <laughs> in fact i want the head of my organization to keep having enough power to pay me and therefore i want him to keep exploiting the world and i don't really tell myself that i just say don't tax billionaires or something like that totally where you know i i know i know you're not a sociologist and i know you're not going to come out as a radical communist right now but where <laughs> where do where do our economic and political and collective phenomena have things that you think look like symptomatology that look like things that would be treated um, by something like psychology if it was operative at that scale and in those domains yeah uh, it's a great question uh, specifically in utah we're moving from the 11th floor of analysis the analysis of an individual human person which is where my expertise is into the 12th floor of analysis which is the group dynamics that emerge in relation Group dynamics in humans is then coordinated by the capital C culture systems of justification, which then regulate investment and influence patterns from below. And then investment and influence patterns are regulating justification. That's then your cultural anthropology model, whereby you're tracking groups and have to have identities and investment and influence relationships within them. And then ultimately you get the emergence then of technological structures, systematic technological structures, first with you know, hunter-gatherer at one level, horticultural at another level, agricultural, and then full-scale civilizations, which are then embedded in all the technological architecture. Okay, And now you have sociology, political science, and economics that are then tracking the sociocultural societal group assemblages and the processes by which technology, group organization, belief value, making, meaning making systems all work. Okay. So I want to be clear that if I'm going to try to, what I'm going to try to study here is the societal assemblage and networks of societal other assemblages. Um, and there are going to be some aspects of that, that are going to be very, a human psychologist is going to be very relevant for, at least from a human psychology perspective. Okay. Um, and indeed, I'm a huge of the, one of the great challenges of a second enlightenment, if we get this right, if John and I and you and, ever, and we get actually a model of the ontology of the mental into human persons that's consistent with natural science, but it affords a clear language, and then it's going to grow into the societal group processes and then create iterative clarity in, in that relation, kind of like from physics to chemistry, only from human psychology into the social sciences. And there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done. What just justification system theory does is it really gives you the clear lineage from human psychology into the social construction of knowledge and social constructionist perspectives on culture. Um, and then they get into epistemology issues, but I just want to emphasize the ways in which culture then operate. Okay. What I am much less aware of how to do because I'm just ignorant is the societal assemblages, the institutional architecture of energy transfer and the economic market potentials that allow for energy transfer in relation and create equilibrium flow states in technological structures that the economists would study as market need-based exchange. There's a lot there to be said, 
but I'm ignorant about an enormous, too much economics and too much sociology. So that's my clarifying disclaimer. Yeah, I appreciate that's right? where it would go and that we need to go there. We don't want to jump too soon and you don't have expertise in that. But um, we can here. here I'll, I'll say this, though. I'll say this uh, in terms of here's a pretty clear analogy that I think folks can really resonate with. So systems of power, justificatory systems of power start to gain control of particular institutions. An institution is a network of technological power, economic power, that then has belief value structures. Politics is the process by which individuals then are getting these institutions together and then trying to network bodies of influence. Okay. The human, the, the United States political system was always, was then structured to be, well, George Washington wanted to be a multi, it becomes a dual party system. The initial idea of a dual party system is we're going to archetypally represent different features of human interest, okay? And ideally, we'll do it in a positive opponent process way. You can argue that the conservative side of the equation recognizes a particular kind of hierarchy, recognizes a particular kind of relationship with the past, and affords an authoritarian deference to that structure, and then adds the individual responsibility to both submit to that and achieve within that conservative structure. It's archetypally more masculine, by the way, Okay. Whereas the other perspective is, hey, how is the system unequal and how do we care for the disenfranchised to afford much greater equality? That, by the way, is archetypally feminine Okay, in the way it's structured. You get a conservative Republican and liberal Democratic view. Okay, Ideally, like a good family, we could have archetypally masculine and feminine governance structures in good balance with one another to create a healthy opponent process of regulating so that the government is for the people and creates a masculine feminine energy that is like a good family. Okay. But then shit happens and the institutional structures for a whole host of reasons come apart and reestablish their identities as I'm not a healthy half of you, like a yin yang relationship. You're the fucking enemy. Okay. The other guys are a team, which we need to win. This is enormously analogous to a marriage that then has a number of betrayals that then turns into a vicious divorce, whereby the identity is you're going to side with dad and Trump, or you're going to side with Hillary Clinton and mom, and which are you going to be good by, and whether you're going to identify which part of the family you actually are going to represent. And I believe we've essentially, so you can see the archetypal structures of influence and investment and justification and group behaviors you know, as thinking about a family and think about this, that is the fractal. And now we'll project that and see various kinds of processes. And yeah, I think that you can make a lot of good insights thinking about humans as fractals that then get represented in these macro level processes and the aggregate patterns can be thought of as fractal dynamics that emerge from the underlying human architecture. There's something very attractive about the idea of applying um, a therapeutic approach to internal family dynamics at the level of the legislatures. <laughs> uh, the first I thought the difference is that someone's paying themselves in the divorce, but of course there is the lawyer who wants <laughs> the, wants the situation to escalate. <laughs> it's not just a negotiation between two parties. No. Somebody gets paid when it gets worse. <laughs> That's, uh, well, and indeed now you obviously now you have the operatives and indeed the entire intellect, the legislative system in yeah. many ways and, it, and the entire structure of the ways in which, uh, you know, they, we, we manage the, the various domains of who gets elected where and the mapping and everything else. We basically kept paying people to create competitive divisions. And now, yeah, it's like now the lawyers are just going at each other in our political structure and the people are then being, you know, greatly endangered in relationship to that as being the opponent process of governance. Something that popped up for me um, a little bit earlier while you were talking was how how much of a parallel there is to the example of the hypothetical rapist we were talking about earlier, mm. right? Which is to say, if we were to look at an organization and go, well, this is a healthy corporation. I mean, we're making money for our shareholders. We're accomplishing things. We're growing. Yes, but you're being terrible for the rest of the system. Right. How do we make those distinctions at a sociological level, not just the therapeutic level? And who would even exist to make them? Who, who's in the position of being that therapist? These extremely un, unanswered and possibly unknowable questions, certainly at the moment. But we should be, I think, looking to those analogies to help inform our social sensibilities. 
I mean, that speaks to many ways, my own little life here in the la- over the last 10 years. So I would have said, you know, when Obama's getting elected, I- I'm in the middle of the academy. I'm, I'm a little frustrated. My ideas aren't getting, you know, I'm a- certainly concerned about the environment, but I am of the opinion, you know, the thing of an and sort of, I have a default Steve Pinker enlightenment now version of reality. Okay. And that is, is like, yeah, things are going along pretty well. When we look at the long arc of progress, we're moving in the right direction. Okay. And that's still potentially true. Okay. But I will certainly also say that over the last five years, as I shifted, there are a number of things that happened where the potential, the uh, possibility of global civilization collapse and the all sorts of intersecting meta crisis turned me from sort of a conventional left uh, leaning enlightenment now person to wait a minute, we may be fucked. Okay. And, and what we were doing in corporations while it was like, yeah, it hurt the environment some. And yeah, it's kind of so it's like, no, this is part of a game a mentality that's chewing up the world. Okay. And we need a meta modern sensibility in relation. And then what is the ground upon which you step outside convention, see the arc of reality, which is a hyper object that you know, I got pretty good conceptual capacity. I fucking can't really see it. I think I see it, you know, but I have really no idea what the hell's happening. <laughs> I'm just trying to project patterns and gather some things and see what the hell makes sense to my particular psyche. Um, of course, that's what we all do. But bottom line is, is that, you know, this issue about, and then how to be in relationship, you know, how to be in relationship to my family, where it's like, okay, we're going to buy all this gift, uh, you know, all these gifts. And I look around and I'm like, we don't need any of this shit. This is hyper-capitalistic bullshit that we're participating in on the one hand. And oh my God, it's Christmas, Greg. This is where we all come together and love each other. And then are you an asshole that says Christmas is, you know, corrupt or, and, or are you ruining the family of a love that's always there? I, I mean, I have these serious questions in relationship to my own participation in a conventional modernist culture. And the answers weren't always clear to me in terms of like, you know, am I some arrogant megalomaniac that can see beyond everybody, which because I really have ego issues, or is actually I'm really seeing shit and people are fucking blind and they're chewing up the goddamn earth and and we're actually all on the Titanic. Yeah. I mean, I guess history will tell to return it to the we'll arc tell. of well-being. We'll, we'll put it in the arc of well-being and be like, well, four generations from now, somebody can answer that question. <laughs> I can definitely relate to being the guy in the house who has the anti-Christmas stance and the conversations <laughs> you then have to go through about whether it's your problem or everyone's problem. <laughs> well, there it is, brother. I have a fa- I have a sense that you and I have been the guy in the place uh, in multiple parallel worlds. <laughs> so I have this sense that not quiteness and incompleteness and adjacency and relationality and things like that apply at all levels of all these different stacks. Totally. And it leads to a question in terms of well-being about, again, where where those balances are just right. So if a person comes to therapy and they complain that they feel offset from or not completely identified with themselves, if they find they're they're mysterious to themselves, Mm -hmm. to what extent is that a problem to be solved by the therapist? And to what extent is that a fact or condition about being a person that the therapist has to render more acceptable and clarified? Lovely. So, you know, when you get healthy, do you still not quite know if you're yourself or not? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, I mean, I, you know, this is, I mean, John, I, I think would uh, get this right, is that we're evolving dynamic participatory beings at our core. And at that level, as soon as you're like turning into a static procedural recipe and clear static identity, you're done in the water anyway. So at least that's what I, so it's, you know, it's a journey, not a destination. It puts everything in motion in particular ways. There's always movement uh, people want recipes, but almost occasionally that's okay. But for the most part, in terms of the actual being of life, that's the wrong mode of operation, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so there's the, the general process is, yeah, there will be, there'll be ways of not knowing yourself that are clearly problematic. Okay. There are systematic processes where there's an individual denies, you know, certain key moments in their ways, certain key ways of being, and I can see why they deny it. And I can see the neurotic consequences of that denial. And I can see that that puts themselves against themselves in particular types of ways. And then when I see that, then it's like, I'm glad you're here because as a psychological doctor, I can diagnose your maladaptive defensive structure. 
and how you're engaged in a triple negative neurotic loop, whereby there's been these negative situations, you have negative feelings, and then you have these network of secondary reactions that sort of make sense. You're sort of aware of, you're sort of not, you're doing the best you can, but essentially you're avoiding and controlling and distancing yourself from your feelings, from your past, from aspects of who you are. And that's, and then that situates you to basically be at war. You have one set of, I can't see this. Another person, I'm here. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh God. And now I'm confused. It's like, that's not ideal. Okay. Definitely. And that's a psychological doctor, like cleaning out your gut. You had an allergic reaction to this shit. We're going to feed this thing and then we're going to run it through. And now the gut's flowing a lot smoother. Okay. But the, the notion that there is an essentialist thing to discover as the core of yourself. And then once you discover it's like some treasure and you open up the treasure, now you know what's in it and that's what it is. And now you're fully clean among what it is. That's not what the self is about. Uh, that's not the right analogy. It's too fixed. It's too essential. It's too static. Um, there is an enormously ongoing, dynamic, iterative process about you're disclosing yourself to the world. The world's disclosing yourself to you. Your, your body's doing that at the animal body level, your mammal primate stuff's doing that, your person's doing that, you're in relations with others and doing that. If you go through a transformative experience, like my life is in the midst of a transformation, okay, um, right now, and it's like, huh, the equilibrium's in my life and then how they're going to be reconstituted. There's a lot of variables that I, what is my new self going to be? That's a I, you know, good question. I certainly have a sense. I'm a mature individual who's thought a lot about it. I do have a sense of self-continuity over time, but I want to discover who my new self is going to be. I want to be open to that. I want to be, you know, curious about it. I'm sure it's going to come with some pain and some novelty and some continued dynamic growth. That to me is the uh, attitude I would generally try to cultivate. Uh, I want to highlight this notion of triple negative neurotic looping because it's a great phrase and I think it's very useful. I brought it up when Bruce and I were discussing the grieving of the death of God with John. Um, the sense that something goes wrong and then you have bad feelings about it and then you have a bad attitude about those feelings. <laughs> and then this can all accelerate itself, <laughs> right? So that the, the, the essential therapeutic intervention there is to be, get at least a curiosity or some kind of more positively valence response to the negative feelings. So, okay. I'm at least just going to have the negative feelings <laughs> exactly. and that will at least break the loop to some degree. So we are like, well, here we are in our godless universe. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I don't, I don't think there's any problem with that. This is Nietzsche's example of the madmen mm -hmm. with the, the atheists right. who don't realize that they have to experience the death of God. <laughs> They just think they can be atheists now. Right. <laughs> like, no, no, there's some bad feelings there. Something's <laughs> missing. <laughs> we did right. something. How do you feel right. about that? <laughs> totally. Totally. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to highlight that because I think it's a great concept and a great phrase. I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I mean, it, I really, you know, so my, um, I'm this president of the Society for Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration, and my theme is toward a common core. And then I try to identify the common core problems of mechanisms of processes and principles that really should be sort of the, the art and craft of psychotherapy as epicenter. Um, and it then says that the problems are these entrenched maladaptive patterns. Okay. And then I do really find that the idea of what it causes the entrenched maladaptive patterns is very nicely summarized by the triple negative neurotic loop. It really is you know, negative events happen. You become aware of them and you get negative feelings. And by the way, that's part of the human condition. Okay. But what happens next is fundamental. And you get this reactive, controlling, negative structure on top of this relationship, okay? As opposed to the under creating the proper intrapsychic and interpersonal context for metabolizing negative events that cause negative feelings. And I see an enormous amount of neurotic maladaptive pathology well captured by the secondary negative reaction. It's a secondary emotional feeling, whether it's a habit like going to drink, whether it's a psychodynamic defense, whether it's a justification and a cognitive or existential sense, all of these structures point to particular ways in which people manage negative situations and negative feelings um, and that then create problems. And indeed, if we can bring lenses to that, become psychologically mindful yeah. about those, like, those negative reactions, bring a calm MO flashlight to that, 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 that creates a pretty good frame uh, for capturing and reversing uh, this big chunk of human experience. Uh, obviously, that's a tendency we're all prone to, but it's also interpersonally entrained. 
Totally. Right? I, I have this, uh, I'm concerned when people say sorry and I want to A, ask them to investigate whether they're actually sorrowful or not, or I want to tell them to not be sorry because I like them and I don't feel bad about the situation. <laughs> and in all of that, I'm like, I'm doing a verbal exchange to say, hey, don't check in with your bad feeling. <laughs> right. And how many people in your life told you not to feel sorry, not even to check that second layer of the negative feeling so that that can be disastrous in its accumulations. Totally. I mean, I think our entire society at the justification meaning is all fucked up in its capacity, even to sort out these basic issues like negative. So many people come to me. Negative feelings mean that bad th that things are bad and they are. Then they get fused as well. Negative feelings themselves are bad. It's like. Okay, so wait a minute. <laughs> you get you got a total clusterfuck of your understanding of the world, you know. Um, and I often use the example of, well, oh, all right, let's switch it around. If negative feelings are bad, what if I told you, oh, yesterday my entire family was killed in a car accident, but thankfully I'm so healthy that I'm here today doing therapy with you, so we're in good shape because I now know how to erase all negative feelings. And the person will be like, oh my god, you're a sociopath. It's like, okay, so now we know that negative feelings aren't themselves bad. OK, in relation. And so even to simple stuff like that, people are confused about many well-meaning, intelligent adults. It goes back to a preaching moment I make from an educational perspective. My kids go through K through 12, OK, at a public school, and I don't think they get a sophisticated hour's worth of education on what an emotion is and how the hell, you know, you know, 12 fucking years. And you don't actually have a single lesson for a single hour on educating them about what emotions are. That's, you know. Huh, that's interesting uh, in terms of how we're trying to socialize. And then I, in psychotherapy, see person after person. Well, I thought negative feelings were bad. It's like, oh my God, you know, it's a problem. Sorry, that's my little preacher moment. Okay, the, Jesus. Yeah, it's the sad rain cloud and the happy sunshine from <laughs> kindergarten onward. <laughs> Basically, you know, you know, good and bad, same thing. Well, I mean, you know, just the easy, easy. Like, oh, yeah, I've got a, I, it's like, oh, I, I get a curiosity, then I get a question, and then I get a, like a, a backup run at it through some kind of personal anecdotal thing. And then I stylize that. <laughs> so here's how I would do this. <laughs> I'm like an old school non-duality radical. So I sit down, I find my feeling attention is automatically flowing somewhere. I inspect that where I, and I notice that it's flowing as it always does toward an unresolved and or stressful relational engagement that seems to be opposed to my ease, security, liberty, and consciousness. But I say to myself, because I'm a non-duality radical, no, this can't be the case, right? <laughs> Mentally, I'm like, there's no way the problem of engagement and my liberating freedom can be opposites. That can't mm. be the case. So it can't <laughs> work like that. <laughs> even if I'm not feeling that, they've got to be coincident somehow, even though mm. I don't know exactly how, right? Mm. So there's something about the feeling of problem, whether harsh or extremely subtle, that has to also be the circumstance of my liberty and freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's how I feel. That's the kind of maniac I am. But it leads me to wonder, like, what is problemness? What is a problem? You were talking about entrenched maladaptive patterns. Yep. And I immediately thought, well, what makes it maladaptive and what makes it a pattern? So totally. what is a problem? And that means, like, what is a problem? But also, why, what is a problem? How is it a problem rather than many problems or, you know, something like that? Where does it get its specificity and where does it get its maladaptiveness? Do we know anything about these? <laughs> yeah, no, these are wonderful questions. Uh, you, you know, um, so, and I have to be aware of the time here just a little bit um, in relation. Uh, so let me try. Have, have you got a hard cutoff here? Uh, uh, 205 or so. Uh, sure. Okay. We'll do it that way. Um, so, okay. So I'm embedded as a psychotherapist. I get trained in a psychotherapist. It makes natural sense to me. I basically just internalize a normative self-structure. What do I mean by that? If your friend, your girlfriend cheats on you and then spreads it all over and then you get betrayed and humiliated, it's a given to me as a psychotherapist that that's injurious and painful. <laughs> okay. I didn't need to think too hard about that. I basically want to say, oh, injuries happen. How do I create a healthy holding environment? I start with that notion. OK, that the self wants to be seen, known and valued, that the ego wants to be justified, that the person wants to be respected by the social field, etc. When injuries happen, I want to care about that. So that was my original structure. OK, now, if you go non-duals, you know, Eastern non-dual, etc., um, and then you get 
what I would then say you make, and this is the jump that happened. I worked with Rob Scott and others, and I had this notion. I called it the experiential self, okay? And it's reason it's got those two words, and there's one aspect of it is the experience of awareness itself, and then there's the self that's doing the gripping about the implication of what that awareness is, okay? Well, the Eastern traditions and other meditative things, and Rob Scott in particular made this clear from our shared Western background, so you can just be aware of the witness function itself. The witness function then is a manifestation or instantiation, I would say, of an ontic epistemic realization. An ontic is real, epistemic is awareness of it, just realized in the moment. Okay. So then you get a non dual is this. There's this my, my sense of being as awareness, as at least a slice of isness in and of itself at the now. Okay. And if you then value and embrace that, I think there's a lot of what you, when people that are able to do that through and through, that's when the death of the ego, the no self nirvana, the awareness of just is this itself as the way it needs to be in total proper relation with whatever the hell it is doing and ought to be, it simply ought to be is what it is. <laughs> okay. And I can now relate much more to that, which totally then disconnects it from the grabbing of the self from the ego, from the persona, and affords you a particular way of being in the world that I think is beautiful. I'm getting better developed, but I'm still painfully underdeveloped relative to some of the masters in this capacity. Okay. And I think this is a tremendous wisdom tradition. However, it's also the case that if you, you can argue, and this gets back to this whole issue of nirvana versus compassion. Okay. Well, if you just do that, do you turn into an aso sociopath? That really doesn't give a fuck about anything because everything is the way it already is. And that you have compassion for the self and the ego and the persona and the whole world that cares about stuff that then puts ought based values that it is painful to be rejected and betrayed and that we ought to have compassion and we try to reduce suffering. Okay. So to me, the answer is, huh, we want to have both this capacity to really embrace awareness into isness in a particular kind of way that detaches yourself at some level creates the detachment, creates capacity for acceptance. And I think we're horribly underdeveloped in the West in this ability. At the same time, I think you have to toggle back and think about why we're primates and we care if we die. <laughs> and we think it's a bad thing. And actually, I don't want to like dissipate that into pure awareness so I don't care if I die. No, I care if I die. I care if I'm rejected. There are a lot of then dysfunction and distress dimensions, okay, and then at a neurotic level, the basic issue is, oh, if you're trying to cope with the world, okay, that, that happens to you, and you do so in a way that spreads distress and dysfunction while you're trying to create happiness and better functionality, but what you're doing ironically does the reverse, well, then we can be pretty clear that you have a, char a character neurosis, whereby the way you try to avoid control and adjust create is like bringing oil to a fire. And we, at a common sense level, we can say, hmm. The how you are coping is maladjustment and a maladaptive strategy because the way in which you do it pulls in more distress and dysfunction, even though your value is to concrete more optimal functioning and less distress. And I can help you show you how it does that. And I can help you try to reverse that. Well, you're freaking me out because you're making me think my immune system is psychologically maladaptive <laughs> because it often causes as much hassle as it's trying to solve. <laughs> ah, well, I, 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 I totally, I'm, I have a uh, asthma and, and, uh, and allergies and hay fever. So I, I have a mixed relationship to my immune system. <laughs> it's a little neurotic and it causes me problems. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're coming to the end. Uh, I'm going to try not to prompt too many more things because there's a lot of different ways I could still go on this and I could add in, but I would love to hear, you know, what, what, what are the cluster of things we want to essentially put under the heading of well-being, right? If you, if you were looking at a person, you know, in a world and in relationships, what are the markers of well-being? What are, what are we looking for? What are the basic sets of qualities we expect to have organized under that rubric? Lovely. Okay. Um, so we take the descriptive at a really descript, unbelievably descriptive level. You basically, the, the uh, what's the person's sense of life satisfaction? How complex can they reflect on that life satisfaction? What are the domains in which they're satisfied in and how satisfied are they? So where are they in terms of overall? Hey, on a scale of one to 10, I'm a nine. My relationships are going well. My finances are going well. I'm secure, et cetera. Okay. I have love, work, play. Uh, with purpose and value and meaning. That's another way to sort of summarize that. 
from a reflective first person perspective check. The affective system has a three to two, two to one balance of positive affectivity to negative. Can access negative activity most of the time. It's on the positive side, feeling good about what it is, has access to pride, to love, to joy, okay, in the proper relation and idols pretty good. So that gives you a subjective description of the psyche in relation as pointing to the positive as opposed to the negative. Then you look at the basic functioning, the mental functions, like, for example, what's the memory function? <laughs> what's the coherent perceptual functioning? What's the attentional functioning? And then you look at psychodynamics from what's level of self-deception? What are the filtering functions around shadow dynamics? What are the issues of particular processes of underlying trauma? And this gets into the coherent integrated structure of the psyche inside of itself, sort of the internal vertical working model structure relative to the interpersonal horizontal relational structure. Okay. Well, then put that, which gives your psychic structure, we're going to see is it biologically healthy, like bring a physician in, say, you know, what's the basic blood pressure, what's is there cancer present, et cetera. All right. And then put that in the social and material environment and give your social policy and environmental checker checklist and say, hey, are resources met? Are they being, are they living in sustainable ways, et cetera? And then fundamentally, are we looking at this from a value-based perspective? And is there alignment? with the values, which gives you rise to happiness with the um, worthiness to be happy. That's the Kantian summary. Okay. So at a well-being nested model, those are the checklists. If you then get into well, what are the psychological dynamics? So you want to ask, okay, we want to ask environmentalists about the social environment. We want to ask economists by a particular structure. We want to ask then biologists, and then you want to ask psychological doctors. So then psychological doctors will then bring particular lenses to bear, at least the unified theory would then say, okay, what is the coherent integrated developmental relation between the domains of psyche? Okay. Most notably, it, well, or, or human mental behavior from the outside. And then how do I situate this person's narrative experience inside of that and create an inside out, outside in vector analysis. Okay. And then basically it's like, okay, what is this person's potential? What is this person's history? What is the coherent integration? How fulfilled are they in relationship to these domains? And then what are the domains in which they're trying to basically cope with, adjust to, and are they able to do that that releases potential and affords reciprocal opening and flexible adaptive structures? Or do they then get trapped when they try to cope, get negative reactions to negative situations and feelings, and then afford a reciprocal narrowing that traps them and, and constrains them at a process level? Um, those would be some of the process dimensional dynamics I'd be looking at. Fantastic structural summary. I notice you didn't really use the words nomothetic or spectralizing at all. So I commend you for that. <laughs> Always. I got a bad habit. I'm working to break my habit. <laughs> Somebody made me conscious of it. That's right. I think that counts as a pathology. Yeah, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> anyway, uh, excellent mind. I love where you're thinking on this. And it's always a pleasure to be with you, Greg. Dude, man. Two hours flies by, friend. Every time I get the Lehman Pascal two hours, my little I get a little dopaminergic jerk, jump, and uh, a joy all the way through the wisdom stack. And to, this time has been no different.